Welcome back to another episode of Classic Model Trains. I'm Ron. Today we are going to be working on a pre-war Lionel torpedo. This is a 1937 variation of their interpretation of a K4 Streamline. I scared this up a few months back at one of them their vintage store crawls that I did. It's been sitting on my shelf collecting dust. Let's take a look at it. I haven't done anything with it yet. Show you around on it. And then me and all you guys out there and gals, we're going to go through working on it for the very first time. Like all the other ones, I've never seen this before. So we're going through this together. Let's get started. I got the old test transformer set up here for the test track. Let's just see if this thing will run. I, uh, oh, oh, uh oh, oh, oh. Nope. We are not getting good juices. We got the we got our elbows cranked. A little little connection issues going on there. These couplers, I don't I don't know if they were actually made to back into to couple them up or not. Cause what? Oh, it, it's a terrible nightmare. No, I think they had to be hand hand connected. None of this backing in and pulling forward kind of stuff. That is for sure. Let's see what we can do to this. Did you ever notice the silly looking couplers on this thing? My God, what the heck is that? Pre-war Lionels came with four different coupler combinations that were made available. Starting in the early 30s, they came with the old tab and slot. The nice simple ones, they work great. A lot of times the tender and the locomotive to, are still hooked up with a tab and slot style coupler today. Then sometime in the mid 30s, the boys in the engineering department came out with this funny looking thing. They call it the Lionel Combination Coupler. It, it was, a, it was a, you know, a hybrid between the tab and slot and the latch coupler, which would end up being really popular for quite a few years. The latch coupler is supposed to allow automatic coupling back and into it, and, and they're, they're supposed to lift up and click in and everything like that. Since they're mounted on a rivet on the body, it allows the arms to flex around before you, and so you gotta, you gotta line up the couplers and then, and then they're, and, and it's supposed to wear, and it, and it, and all it did was create frustration, and everybody always ended up doing it manually anyway. The fourth variation that, you know, they came out for pre-war stuff, they call it the Lionel Box Coupler. They finally solved the problem of backing up into things to couple up by mounting the coupler to the truck rigidly, instead of to the chassis where it could flop in the wind like this. You know, that allowed the coupler to kind of, you know, pivot as it goes around the curves and everything. It kept it nice and rigid for coupling, coupling into it. When this coupler came out, the E units also became really popular because it allowed the kids or, you know, whoever was playing with them to actually make up consists on their little model railroad. You could back into the couplers, automatically connect, automatically unconnect. So it was more like the real railroad and it captured the kids' imagination a lot more than just watching the thing go around and around the track. Lionel... They, they had the knuckle coupler that they invented. They had it sitting there waiting to go, but they I guess they kind of felt bad about switching out couplers every seven or eight years because it made all their stuff not really hooked together, and guys, guys hated that. Unfortunately, World War II came around. All production was seized for a long time, and this gave them a large enough gap that when they came back out after war, 
so post-war production, they all came out with the knuckle couplers that we're very familiar with today. Oddly enough, they did make some very rare couplers that could go adapter couplers that could make one type hook up to another type, a couple of those, but they are rare as chicken lips, I guess. So couplers, everybody's always changing couplers all the time. It gets so old. Oh, geez. Thing's got some dirt, some dirt and dust on it. Sure, it's been stored for quite some time. Underneath of it here, it's interesting. Really small pickups. And when I seen this bottom cover for the first time with these little cheesy pickups, I thought this might have been a repro, reproduction. And I searched and searched and searched and searched and come to find out that they didn't reproduce this particular locomotive. Best I can tell. Now, you know, I've been wrong before, but I've been eyeballing this thing pretty good. Looks like the way to get it out of there is to get these two little pilot screws up here. It's holding this plate in. And then these two screws right here, which seem to be holding the motor in. Yup. Oh. Two there. This big bugger right here. Oh man. And that look, acts like it goes, it goes, it goes all the way through. Oh she's yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about one more? Same length, sure. Now what's going to happen? What's what's falling apart here now? The hole? That just wasn't any, anything at all like I wanted. Nothing at all. I'd hoped that this guy up front here would come out. He, why ain't he gonna? And then the light bulb. God, look at the size of that thing. It's as big as my thumb. And my thumbnails is about the size of a quarter. Holy jeez. I still want these front trucks out. Up there, that's the one I was looking for. This little piece of tape on this body, looks like it was sitting right there for a while. Uh-oh. What's that? Where did that come from? I bet you that's, oh, really? That's gonna be kind of a little hassle to put in. This is gonna be nice and easy to clean up. Do a little hand waxing to it with some turtle wax. Some scub right through there, but oh, she's going to come back around. I don't see any major scratches on it, considering the age of this thing. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, the light bulb is trying to fall out. I hope that thing still works. Did, uh, oh, oh. It acted more like it had an electrical, oh, issue. See our commutator down here, a little on the buggered up side. That E unit was sure, acting like it didn't want to participate. I'm guessing what we're going to do is we're going to pop this brush holder off. Star internal lock washer, one brass one. That goes all the way through. Is that gonna allow us to lift our, our electromagnet out also? It is appearing like that to me to get my big boy screwdriver out here. Oh yeah, that's easier. You, you, no locker on that one though. That's interesting. The brush, oh, dirty. Oh, God, I hope these are made of something significant. <laughs> Nervous. The E unit came kind of, it's kind of flopping in the wind there. Now I feel like I want to take it out just because there's screws right here and I, and I can. Uh, I'm not going to be able to, I don't have a wheel press and it looks like that's what a guy would have to do to get these wheels out to pry this side off. This is built in such a way that I can't get the motor out. That's how I feel right now. Maybe time will tell. Maybe this comes out. Oh. Well, look at that. It just fell out and I wasn't even looking. Well, that worked out really well. You know, some guy hand wound that. You know that, don't you? That is just amazing. This stator electromagnet, it's probably got another name, I'm sure. Somebody's going to correct me on it. But that's okay, because then I learn more. And then we, you know, if you read the comments, then we get to find out and learn stuff. It's got a rivet in it right there. It ain't coming out. That's, that's just part of it. Guaranteed. Now, I was going after this back here. If it comes out, oh, it does, yeah. This feller, it's in, it's on. There's a spacer right there. This actually points down, yeah. I wanted to see if it let this, oh, it does, yeah. That's what I was hoping for. This feels like it's made out of Bakelite. And since the motor, these pickups are down there. Uh, one, what's going on here? Ooh, one, one wire. This one right there. He's going deep. 
It's taking the plunge all the way to the bottom. There we go. Now we can see it. The way it was acting, it was acting like these are very dirty. This and the wheels. These would come out if I had a net driver. I got to get myself a net driver set. What can we see if we take these out? The bottom of the E unit. So, oh, yeah. Get, get, oh, shoot. Look at that. That drum right there has been knocked out. <laughs> Glad I pulled that out. So I really wasn't in the mood to do it. Got kind of a junk pile here, mostly because I don't feel like unsoldering anything. Maybe I should. Should write a schematic on this, but yeah, we got to get this roller back in. No wonder the thing won't go. Poor little feller. And you know how fun it is to work on these E units here. I'm sure the hobby shop stocks pre-war E units. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This one's been swedged together right there. And when you look in there, there's a gap right there. And that's what's allowed this thing to spread just a little bit. This is what connects and deconnects our, you know, the windings for the solenoid. The electromagnetic solenoid, which pulls this in, which switches this drum, which gives you your forward and back. So that would be locked out and this would be full send. I think I will draw up a schematic on this though, just because there might not be one that exists. And then I could just sit here and Draw it up in case I break something. I'll know where to go and I can offer it to the world. So it's just it's just a win all around. It absolutely is. I think I'm gonna try to take these out because I'm gonna want to polish these. Those are ish. This should come out if I can pry up these two fingers. Yep, right there. So we got a piece of copper, which is, yeah, dirty. And our shoes, pretty straightforward. We got to get all this cleaned up to get the juices to flow better. As you see, that wasn't flowing with the poo. This here's the spring. It just keeps pushing those down, and this ends up being the contact, and you can see that it's corroded also. Tarnish? But tarnished. Brass tarnishes, aluminum oxidizes, and something else corrodes. The bushings aren't wore out in here. A little bit, a little bit. I don't know what the tolerances were. She's definitely gonna run again. I'm surprised it didn't run the first time. Well, no, not really, because... <laughs> hey! Let's stop for just a second here. Let's do a little history on this locomotive that, that actually, it actually existed. In the spring of 1936, the Pennsylvania Railroad pulled out a redesigned, beautiful, streamlined locomotive for its Broadway limited passenger train. They designed this locomotive to be sleek, bullet-nosed, and aerodynamic. They dressed up a K4 Pacific 462 and put the streamlining stuff on it. It was num engine number 3768. This really captured the public's imagination, and I've read that people would stand in line, wait to look at it, just to cast their peepers on it, because it was such an interesting and beautiful looking locomotive. It had a redesigned matching tender that ran on six-wheeled trucks, which were a little unusual for the Pacific K5s at that time. As most streamlined steam locomotives would have it, all the shrouds all over everything and the way it covered up all the mechanical stuff and it made maintenance on the locomotive very difficult. The shrouds over the wheels were initially removed and then by the 1940s all of the streamlining that took place to it was completely removed and the engine was returned back to its original K4 Pacific look. The 3768 can be seen in the 1945 movie The Great Flammer, Flammeron? A words pronunciation, I never get that right. And also in the movie, the Broadway Limited. <laughs> At least it's nice that was the locomotive that pulled it. It's nice they used the original one. Unfortunately, in 1953, the K4 locomotive 3768 was retired and then shortly scrapped after that. It's another sad story, ain't it? Let's get back into it. Well, after crawling around through all of this, and drawing up some drawings, this is what we've decided to come up with for the wiring schematic. This here being the motor, and the, the electromagnet, the field windings, the armature would be inside here. Here's the brushes. This was over the E unit, the way that it's wired up. And then I kind of color coded them just a little bit. 1688, third variation, or the late motor. From what I've read online, who knows? You know, I've been lied to before, being online. But the thing that makes this really different is the fact that the brushes, one of them goes directly to ground. That's why when I took this brush holder off, one of these 
brush screws here. It's got this star washer underneath of it. Well, it went in over on this side and that grounds this thing right to the chassis. That's, this is, this is a, just a little, a little differenter than the others. And the way you can tell, like say if you got it all taken apart, you can see that this, this brush right here, for one, it doesn't have a wire wired to it, but two, it's longer and it goes underneath of this bolt, making that a ground. So this is kind of an oddball. What I'm gonna do next is the old toothbrush and the odorless mineral spirits. And I'm gonna come through here and I'm gonna clean up all this scubby scubby, get all the old grease out of this thing and hopefully not break any of these wires off right there. I'm gonna use a toothbrush with the odorless mineral spirits and I'm gonna brush it here to try to get these spokes cleaned out. And then I'm gonna take the wire wheel on my Dremel and I'm gonna come around and wire wheel these pickups, you know, for these wheels right through here to clean them up and make them nice and shiny. So I'll spend the next hour polishing and cleaning and scrubbing and making this thing so electrically it'll do what it's supposed to do. Yep. This one wasn't too bad. Not too bad, a lot of filth more than anything else. We've got to get this drum right here to stand up inside here without breaking any of these wires off. A lot of times these things are super time consuming and I don't film them, but then some guys come along and go, hey, we kind of wanted to see what you did. So it's like, well, okay. Basically, I gotta, I gotta pry this apart. These two plates right here, it's been swedged in. Here's a swedge mark. And over on this side, there's a swedge mark. And we gotta open it up just enough to be able to get that drum to rotate back down in there. This is kind of the make and break of the whole deal. You go too far and then up, see, yeah, it fell apart. But it might make it easier too. There's all them little fingers in there. And here's the sets of fingers on the bottom that you may or may not ever get a chance to see. And here is that drum. Well, it's out now. Yeah, the whole thing kind of fell apart. So you see that there's there's brass, and then they make, you know, the little connections that come in here. This is what reroutes all the juices. So since in my since it's in my little hands, we can go ahead and clean it up. See these fingers, there's the plate that they're sitting on. This whole thing is actually trying to fall apart in my hand. Here's our little Paul off the electromagnet. But these fingers, they're supposed to be in here all the same. See how they're they're not they're they're not in tune. They should all have the same amount of up upage on them. This little feller on the end looks like he's bent. But nine thousand things that are in the way. Oh yeah, see this is the this is the the annoying part is. Oh now get on on in there. I'm pretty sure that the boys at the factory they get a jig to do this with. Line up five hundred things at once. Come on, get in that hole there. Okay, so now we got the drum in. And it's rotating and now all we got to do is get the bottom plate in holding everything together that bottom plate it looks like they've been a little bent bent up also oh these things are they're so thin so there's the bottom plate and all i gotta do is just lock these two tabs in where these two tabs are at and then we gotta swedge it i believe this is the side that's swedged really good and this side is the one that's loose so now i gotta open this back up just some, so I can get this plate in. Not too much, just some. And I went too much. Okay. Somehow I managed to do it. You can see these two fingers here are riding on the bottom of the drum. The drum is in the correct direction so the paw can come up, grab it, and rotate it. And you can look under here and you can see all four of those fingers are straight and they're riding on the connection also. Now this part right here is the part that failed. And in order to swedge that, we need like a center punch and a flat plate or a socket to set this on and a hammer. We gotta bang that right there and, and expand that end. And you know, that makes me just, that just sounds horrible, doesn't it? That is nerve wracking. Is everybody together? Is this gonna work? Oh, nerve. Nervous? Sure, I'd buy that. This little filler sat right in there like so. One screw there, one screw there. Cleaned up our commutator here real nice. Shine the ends of these shafts just a little bit to try to get some of that old scub off of them. Give this guy a little light oil. He's getting ready to go back in. Down into your happy home, yes. 
Get our brush holder over here. It does not have a metal bushing in this end. Oh, this thing is, looks like I missed cleaning that. Dang it. Good thing I noticed it. We're gonna put that fella on this way. I did clean the brushes up, shockingly enough. Can I just cheat? Balance these right there? Maybe. Well, that did end up working. Fantastic. Let's get these two screws back in that hold the brush holder on. Yep, just a little snuggin. Give this guy a little taste of oil over here. I cleaned this spring up right here with the fiberglass pencil also because the, the juices are coming through it. Get all these all lined up. Things, stuff there, pushes the shoes down. And then this guy had the final say in it. It's gonna go on this pin, hold this whole kit and caboodle together. Yep, oh shit, yes. A rear truck assembly and this bolt goes on. Holding this pickup cover on. Yes. Yes. Now, here we got this bull gear. It needs a little earl. And I'm gonna light oil these instead of grease them. Since they are out in the elements, the grease, it could pick up so much more. I think this is gonna be a little better, little better deal here. Get down here and pick up these axle bushings. Little taste there, little taste there. This is a live axle, it turns. So we gotta put just a little juices here and here on this trailing truck. Here's how I clean these wheels. Set this low. You come in at an angle, you can clean it, put a little friction on it, then it turns, and then you can really get them shined up. Now it doesn't need to go a thousand miles an hour. Going sideways will slow it down some, and that gets those right into shape on these bigger bigger O27s and O's and stuff. I wouldn't do that to an HO, of course. That'd just be silly. We can take it over to the track and see if it even if it even works. Got a chassis ground right there for our bulb. Oh, you betcha. Test the whole thing out at once. Yeah. Hey, you wanna hear about Lionel's history about this torpedo locomotive? Sure, let's go over that. Although the prototypical torpedo locomotive was a Pacific, a 462, Lionel's initial offering was only a 242. Why, why would they do something like that? Well, they had a locomotive that was an 040 that was shaped like the torpedo. It was number 1588. So I guess that when the engineers decided to try to make it a little more closer to prototypical, they just bolted a couple extra trucks on it and called it a day. Patted themselves on the back and you did it, boys! They started making these 242s in 1936 and they numbered them 1688E. And usually the E designation signifies that it's got uh, an E unit in it, a reversing unit. But they didn't, I don't know why they do it. In 1939, Lionel dropped the E off of the number 1688 and rebadged them all just simply 1688 but they still came with the reversing unit in them. Production on these torpedoes, they ended in 1942 and haven't been brought back since. You know, or not that I know of. I, you know, I couldn't find any. In 1937, Lionel did offer a more prototypical six-wheeled version of this particular torpedo locomotive. They're numbered 1668 or 1668E, you know, because of the different production runs and they dropped the E off of it. These locomotives, this 242, it came with three different motor variations and it came with eight different body variations and two different colors. And actually there'd be another variation if you count the windup. The color of this locomotive's original offering was gunmetal gray, but it was changed to a black in 1939. The Lionel Torpedo locomotive was its most famous, most highest sold pre-war locomotive, you know, of all time. Many thousands of them are sold every year, which makes them very common to acquire nowadays. Almost all of the pre-war engines of, you know, of this time, this time period, they all had very large gears on their flanges of the wheels, which makes them impossible to travel through post-war switches or turnouts on your layout. They need to have the pre-war switches in order to work right. Now, I'd love to go over all the variations of this thing with the different motors and the way that they're designed and this and that, but honest, that would fill up an entire video all on its own. I found this fantastic website, or I think it's a thread. It's, it's a, it's, yeah. Here, here's, the, here's the address right here. 
I'll also put it down in the description below the video. If you want to go to that, you can get an absolute eyeful of reading with pictures of all the different variations and all the different ones that came out. And you can also find out which one's the most valuable one. <laughs> yeah. Let's hop back into it. Doesn't take much juice to get her going. Yeah. It's losing juices up here. I haven't cleaned this track in a long time. I probably should do that. Make a little bit of test platform, but we can get the we can get the body back on. Yeah. These bodies were in really pretty good shape when I got them. A little dusty. But I also decided I was going to do the old give them a wax job. I've waxed this one up, spent some time on it, kind of giving it a polish to finish up all the nastinesses or things on it. They've mostly been in their box all their life, kind of rubbing around. So some of that apparent on it is tender. It, it, you know, I mean, it, I, I've waxed it also. But this placard right here, it just didn't wax out. Now I used the old Dremel with the polishing brush on it and I was working on this one over here and I got it a little shinier, but it's it's down inside of this raised dent lip right there. So I guess what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this apart. You only can do this about three times before these tabs are all broke off, but we're gonna stand these tabs up, get this body off, take these placards out and then polish them removed and see if I can get them all kinds of shiny. Carefully, stand them up, yes. Gently, carefully. Slots up here, oh, I've got wax that got stuck in there, yeah. Oh, there it is, and these little fellers. This is what we want. Get some polish and oob on there, see what we can do with them. They got a significant amount on the back side. They're not gonna come around super good, no. There's some oxidation on there. This is just, it's just tin. Dang it, I really wish it would have shined up more. One worked really pretty good, one did not at all. Getting on this little fella right here. Gotta put that truck through. This bolt had this big old shim. We gotta get in over here before all this gets put together. I think we got it there. Long, long buggers. One more for up in here. This nightmare. When I went to pull it out, it was uh, tight, to say the least. And at least it's got to be consistent. A couple little screws there to slip in. Yeah, somebody was home on that one. This one's not in enough. There, there's the problem right there. Yeah, now the hole has showed its ugly head. Took these side rods and waxed them up too. So we can make everything as shiny as possible. We're gonna put those in right there, here. And then let's put in one of these ugly bolts that I neglected to shine. <laughs> God, oh, if I can forget something, I'll do it. Good sized little bolts. I got just a thing for it. Just a snuggin. Give these a little taste. Front truck a little taste. Let's give this pivot just a little something here, something. Give this guy just a little something, something. Everybody always loves the lubrication. I guess since we're at it, we'll lube this tender up. Do these wheels, see now these wheels spin individually on the axles. The whole axle isn't live. She so just come in and drip a little drip in right in here. Do a little spin, do the other ones. They end up doing this to all the cars. But put this tender back together, let's put it on the track. This usually ends up being super hard to film because it moves so dang fast. Oh, neutral. A little forward, yeah. And of course, Lionels aren't made to creep. They're made to go full bore. Oh yeah. We've really only got this thing cracked open just a little bit. Moving along. Almost put the thing wrong direction. I'm gonna finish cleaning up these cars. Got a couple more just to kind of detail a little bit. Throw it on the whole thing. I'm just not sure if this video gives this. Look at this thing. Oh my goodness. The shine. She just shines on her. This is the first time this whole set's been put together. And it's gonna run here 
in who knows how many years. This poor thing could have got dropped years ago and took out that cylinder. So that's why, you know, it won't run. Look at this. Them lanterns, they glow from that light bulb on the inside. Isn't that neat? Light comes out of there. Ah, oh, it's kind of groovy. Yeah. Oh, nurse. I am loving it. Mercy. I'm loving it. Tin plate. Pre-war. Lionel. Resurrected. Back on the rails again. I'm nervous. I don't want to slam it in there. Ending over there. That came out absolutely unbelievable. I've decided I've got, I've got too much stuff in here. I got a lot of stuff. We need to make way for more new stuff to come in. Right now, this thing is available on my eBay thing. Now, I don't have an eBay store. You can't look for that. I'm just an eBay seller. So you can look up the seller's name, Classic Model Trains. I'm going to have this one available for auction on there right now to raise a little funds so we can buy some more stuff. Since I, you know, I don't have a sponsor, except for my me going like this and pulling out my wallet. <laughs> oh. And in the next day or two, I'm going to release a video of a lot of the other ones that I've got for sale up on the eBay. And I'm going to have a link to them. Here's the ad right here for this one. It's, it's up right now, ready to go. So I've bidding on it. Hopefully, we can raise some money. And then you get to own a movie train, a movie model, I guess. it's Every one of these things, I got these tags that I make for them and put on there. So when I sell it, in, it's in your collection. You can tell all your buddies that you've got trained that it was on Classic Model Trains episode. Because all these things, you know, to like our certificate of authenticity. It's not like anybody, you know, they can fake these. They could. But who don't do that? That's not nice. So, <laughs> thanks so much for watching this episode. Thank you to all my 33 percenters out there. I'm Ron, Classic Model Trains. Bye-bye.